Genesis 7. Turn there if you would, please. Appreciate everybody coming back this afternoon. That two o'clock thing, I'm, uh, I'm, hmm. that's hard to do. Because I just got good, and I mean, I was, I was, I was cruising down Z Lane. Yeah. Z and uh, even snored and grunted a couple times. Woke myself up a couple snorts <laughs> like that. Yeah, that's when you know you're in it, man. So, all right. We're studying the flood. Let's start it in verse 1. We'll read down uh, through verse 12, what I have up on the screen. And uh, this time we're going to study the, the prophetic meaning of it, the nature of the flood, what God, how God is going to use this in the future. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Gary came in to me today. God just speaks to everybody. That's what I like about it. And he said, I'm sure you know this, but he said, you know, if you think about it, we are the unclean animals. Because how did Noah and his family go into the ark? By twos, the male and his female. There's Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And I'm going, that's pretty good. I'm stealing that. So I never, I never, that thought never crossed my mind. But I like that. That's good. That's, that's proof right there. That's exactly what it meant. So Gary, you do get points for that. You don't get them taken away, but I'll give them to you. All right. Amen. Somebody's reading their Bible. Amen. Verse three of fowls of the air by sevens. The male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth for yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Notice this 40 days and 40 nights uh, and every living substance that I've made will I destroy from off the face of the earth and Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. It happened exactly the way God said. Now, verse 11 and verse uh, 12. Verse 11 really is the key here. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep opened up, broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. The rain was upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Let me read a couple more verses. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah the, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every bird of Every sort, they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God hath commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. And the flood, as he says it again, was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Think about what Jesus said, and if I, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. Uh, the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were 
covered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you. And I believe this book. I believe this story. I believed it all my life. And uh, Lord, I've always had a fascination, a curiosity with this story and its meaning and the amazing thing that you did. And Lord, I believe that that ark's probably still got to be up there. Maybe it's in pieces by now, but it's parts of it still got to be up there, Mount Ararat somewhere, because that's where you said it was. And I just believe it. I believe your word. I believe that those animals went in. I believe you figured out how to do it. And you're the God that not only judges and pours out wrath upon the earth, but you're the God that saves. And you were able to do both at the same time, in the same way. And Father, teach us some good lessons tonight. Help us, dear God, to uh, understand uh, what this water represents and what the 40 days represents and the ark. And, and just give our minds understanding. Wake up our sleepy eyes and thank you, dear God, for a beautiful sunlit spring day and Lord, we love you and we thank you for the springing up of new life all around us. Just like you did when everybody came off the ark. <clears throat> you had already planted all the seeds again and everything was ready and set to go. That's just how you are. You're a very good God to us. So, Father, we love you and we ask for your kindness and your goodness and open up your word to us and feed us. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Notice the number of times he mentions... Uh, the 40 day period. We mentioned it's there in verse 17. Um, then if you go back verse 12, the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Um, yeah, and in verse 4, he mentioned it 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance I've made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. What do you, th if you were to just take that number, at, you know, the number 40, what, what else in the Bible has significance with the number 40 things that happened in the Bible. Give me other stories. And, and there is a connection, by the way. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. He, he had uh, he had basically had had fasted for 40 days, hadn't eaten anything in 40 days. And that's a long time to go. You can do it. It's been done before, but it you know, that's a long time to go without food. Uh, but that's what he did. Um, give me another one. Moses, when he would when, when he'd go up on Mount Sinai, I think both times that he was up there for 40 days um, at a time. And then he would come back down and he'd have the law in his hands. Uh, give me another one. Huh? Sure, the, the 12 spies went into the land to spy out the land for 40 days. And on the 40th day, they came back with their report, and it wasn't good. They, Ten of them said, we can't go in. Two of them said, of course we can go in. God said we could go in. Why don't we, why don't we believe God? And so basically, they had basically a church committee meeting. And the, and the church voted, we can't do this, we can't do this. And so... God said for every day that they was in the land, spying it out, writing up their evil report, that's how many years I'm going to make you walk. And they walked in a circle for 40 years, not knowing where they were, not knowing where they were going to be the next day, until every one of them died. Every single one of them died that left Egypt. And I remember the first time that this hit me, the only two people who left Egypt, only two got to go in the promised land that left Egypt. Now, there were thousands that went into the promised land. They were the generation of those that were born in the wilderness or those who were too young to make that decision that to either go or not go. Uh, so God didn't hold them accountable for it. But it, that was a 40-day process. Anybody else? What about Elijah when he was fed by ravens and he went in the strength of that meat for 40 days, the Bible says. Um, so what does that, that kind of give you the idea of? 
the, that number 40. What do you think that sort of represents? Just kind of asking your, your, if you were to look at it from the whole of the Bible, what do you think it stands for? Yes. Okay, yeah, it does. Uh, there's, there's something related to the gospel in every bit of that. In the case of Moses, he's coming down with God's covenant. He's a picture of Christ coming down from heaven. When he comes the first time, the Jews reject that. When he comes the second time, they accept it. They're going to accept it, okay? So the gospel, let's say, in, um, with Elijah, he ate and it gives him life. Like Jesus told the woman at the well, if you drink of this water, you shall never thirst again. That kind of comes to mind there. The fact that Jesus was the sinless Lamb of God being tested 40 days in the wilderness to give proof of that so that he through weakness uh, became strong for us. So you, that the, the gospel does perfectly match that. It fits that, all right? And also with the, the issue of the flood is that God is saving them. God is saving the seed. He's saving Noah and his, and his family during that time. Somebody else. What is that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, when, when a, and according to the law, when a woman gave birth, she was unclean. And it's interesting because it was divided up. She was unclean for seven days. And then she went, I uh, don't remember the exact law, but she went through a purification process. And then for the next 33 days, she was unclean again after she had given birth to a man-child. It was different with a girl, but with a man-child, her purification process lasted 40 days. So in that, you see a picture of the gospel where Christ purifies that which is unclean. Okay? Um, something I didn't, I didn't mention, the reign of both David and Solomon, each one of them reigned 40 years over the Israelites. And in David's case, it was divided up almost exactly like the woman who gives birth. He reigned seven years in one place and 33 years in another place. Okay? It's very interesting because Jesus was king of the Jews for 33 years. Okay? So I always thought that there might be a connection there somehow. Anybody else got an idea of the number 40? What about um, the idea of Trial or temptation or probation or testing. The trial of your faith. Because 40 days, the spies were out and God was testing their faith at that time. Okay, 40 days, Moses on Mount Sinai. God's testing them. Okay. Jesus in the wilderness. He's tempted after 40 days. Um, yes, Rose. That's what I, that's what I, somebody, that there's been more than one person brought up the idea that what if our quarantine lasts 40 days? Is that maybe a message from God that he's giving us a time of probation and testing and saying, how, how are you going to respond to this? So we won't know until day 41. Okay. I don't think anybody is ever smart enough to say, this is how it's exactly going to happen. Okay? Maybe. I don't know. Some people are hoping they're right, no matter how many people die, I guess. But anyway, so I, I have heard that. Yeah, I had somebody bring that up to me the other day. Anybody else on the number 40? Okay, that's part of it. Whenever there's a, a trial, a temptation, it is, um, it's almost like who's on the Lord's side and who isn't. And God uses that 40 to make it very, very clear and distinct who is and who isn't. Okay, um, could you get me a bottle of water, please? So... So let's, um, let's do this. Let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel. This is going to set up what I'm going to um, show you about 
a little theory I have about the symbolism of the flood waters. Now, when I say symbolism, I don't mean to imply that it didn't literally happen, because I, I believe it has to. If, if God establishes something as a symbol, it has to be real. As Jonas was in the bellies, uh, belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. If Jonas wasn't really in the whale's belly three days, then Jesus made that up. But he said, Jesus himself said that he was there. He put him in there. Jesus put him in there. So um, it has to be true. We, we don't base what we believe, anything of what we believe, on a lie. or a, We don't follow cunningly devised fables, Paul said. Okay? Or Jewish traditions, Jewish fables. We don't follow mythology. We don't use false stories to try to relay a truth. We tell the truth to try to advance the truth. So in Daniel chapter 2, notice there's a couple things here. Nebuchadnezzar has his dream in Daniel 2, and um, he wants to know what the meaning of, of the dream is. He can't, thank you, JR, he can't remember the dream, and he can't remember, he doesn't know then what it means. So look in verse 2. The king commanded to call, count these, the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, four. Okay? Uh, by the way, who's seen Frozen 2? The movie, Frozen 2. It is 100%, uh, it's like a documentary film teaching you how to do elemental witchcraft. Okay? Because Elsa, the girl who touches things and makes them freeze, she gets called, she finds a secret map, it's called to the north, goes down into like a pit thing, and the, there's this idea in witchcraft and, and in any other kind of religion that believed in the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water, that when they were joined together, then there was a fifth element called ether or spirit. And you literally see that happen in the cartoon, is that you see the four elements joining together. She stands in the middle of that. She now is the ether, the spirit. And think about what Paul said. Another spirit, another Jesus, and another, you said, gospel for 40. Another gospel, okay? And witchcraft is another gospel. And what the devil has in mind for mankind with the mark is another gospel as well, okay? So think along those terms. I, I would tell you, if you, you know, I, I believe that you can't, and, you, and it's not a good idea to just put your kids in a bubble. Don't let them see anything in the world because at some point they're going to. And what you have to do is train them. So if you let your kids watch it, explain to them, look, see that? That's what Pastor Mike was talking about. That's witchcraft. Okay, that is not the gospel. It's not something that you want. And the Frozen movies, like the number one film Disney's ever produced. More, they've made more money. It's been more popular than anything. So it just stands to reason that they would try to promote that idea, that concept. So Daniel chapter 2, you have the four. You have the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans. These are his counselors. And we know the story. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream. And so he said, tell me what I dreamed or I'll kill you all. And they said, oh, king, nobody, you know, no king's ever done that. And so then we have Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, four on God's side, four on the devil's side. And to me, that this is great because the four on God's side wins. While the four on the devil's side could not tell the king what the dream was, the four on God's side could. They prayed. They spent one night in prayer. God gave Daniel the interpretation, gave him the dream, 
Which is, I mean, how easy is that? I couldn't tell you what you dreamed last night, Gary. Okay? I'm not sure you would want to tell me what you dreamed last night. Okay? But, but Daniel knew it. How do you know what somebody else is thinking? So anyway, so he gives the dream. And in that dream, verse 31 of Daniel 2, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible, and the image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. And essentially there's four parts to this, and yet there's five. Okay, the, the gold, the silver, the brass, the feet are iron, but the toes are iron and clay mixed. It's almost like out of the four comes the fifth one. Okay? And the toes are important. The toes are the whole thing. If you chop your toes off, okay, and that's what they tell you, that's what my dad dealt with with diabetes, Phil, was he had about three toes cut off at various times because he would get infections in his feet and his body couldn't fight it off and so they had to He'd be in the hospital for a month fighting off this infection. They finally had to cut off a toe. And it affected how he walked. So the, the ten toes are holding this whole thing up. Okay? The whole, the whole image, all the kingdoms now of the earth are being held up by these ten toes. And these ten toes have a very serious weakness. They're a divided kingdom. It's divided against itself because you have iron and clay which don't mix. They don't go together. It's like oil and water, okay, or fire and water. They don't go... It's funny that hydrogen and oxygen are extremely flammable except when you put them together the right way. Then they put fires out. So anyway, um, the the... Part of this that I think is relevant is, of course, look at verse 42. And as the toes in the, of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So I think the 40 days, and, and notice... Here, he's talking opposites, iron and clay, strong and weak. So, when we go back to Genesis 7, notice in verse 12, the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Why does he have to say it that way? Because you just automatically know that was 40 days ago. Well, we automatically figure in that it was also 40 nights ago. Okay? So why is he, why is God saying it this way, days and nights? I think to show us that this, this time here and the rain is part of the fourth kingdom. Because days and nights are opposites together. All right? And then we look at where the water came from. The two sources. Number one, the fountains of the great deep. It didn't just rain for 40 days. If you notice, it rained all day yesterday. It started Friday night. It rained all night and all day. Okay, And I noticed all the rivers and creeks were high and everything like that. So would it, if it was raining 40 days on the earth nonstop, that would cause quite a bit of flooding. However... The water was above the highest mountain peak. Now, what's the highest mountain? Everest. It's like 40,000 feet, something like that, give or take. I don't know that at the time before the flood that the highest mountain was 40,000 feet, was Mount Everest. I don't, I don't know that. I don't think any of us know that. Um, 
reasons. Because some people's arguments against a worldwide flood that covered all the land and covered the highest mountain, they would say it's ridiculous to believe the idea that, that there was 40,000 feet of water on the earth above and 15 cubits above Mount Everest. It's ridiculous to think that. Okay, granted, but we don't know what the highest mountain was at that time because we know, here's one thing I do believe in. Um, I believe that there was, before the flood, there was one giant landmass. Okay? You know, South America just fits very snugly into Africa. It looks like they were split apart. It, and, and the Bible actually says, if you go to, uh, go to Genesis 10, look in Genesis 10. I'm going to show you. God tells you that there was a day when the earth split in half. And there was a kid named after that event. Um, let's see here. Yeah, verse 25 of Genesis 10. And unto Eber, this is where the, we, we get the word Hebrew from. Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. So I think, and even geologists say that there was a landmass called Pangea. Pan means the whole of it, a spread across, and Gia is the earth. And so there was one great big giant landmass. Now, in the days of Peleg, that's after the flood. And here's, I'm going to illustrate it like this. You ever notice that on the continent of North and South America, the mountain range, the Rocky Mountains come from Canada all the way down through the western part of the United States, and then you look down the western half, the western side of South America, the Andes mountain range. Okay? So, let's say that this is North and South America, and they just split off from Africa and Europe. Okay? And they're gliding. The land is gliding on this water that's under the earth. And then it stops. And when you stop, it pushes the paper up like that. You see that? When you look at North and South America now, those mountains got pushed up. Okay? It's, it, when you look at it now, you'll, you'll see it. Every time you see it, every time you see the uh, globe with the Rocky Mountains and the Andes Mountains, it looks like they got pushed up. Looks like the, the land stopped and it went, er, and it pushed it up. That's how I've heard Henry Morris, uh, who was a great creation apologist, uh, loved the King James. And uh, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. But that was, that's always been the idea was that when the earth divided, the land, the continents moved and then they stopped and that pushed, that had the effect of pushing these mountain ranges up, which is why you have the Appalachians and the Rocky Mountains, North America, and why you have the Andes mountain range in South America, because they basically stopped and it pushed the mountains up. So it's possible that before the flood, the highest mountain may not have been 40,000 feet. You see what I'm saying? There's possibilities. We're not told. So God says, Mike, quit talking about it. Move on to something. There's more important things to deal with. But I just thought I'd throw that in. Okay? There's a way to believe it. There's a way to believe it. All right? Um, but the water came from two sources. Fountains of the great deep opened up. And then the waters came down, the windows of heaven were opened, is what he says. So, Jesus told us, as it was in the days of Noah. So turn now, Revelation 9.
verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Uh, one theory is that um, the theory that killed the dinosaurs is that the earth was hit by a giant meteorite, uh, a big one. And it basically just shifted the whole planet. Um, destroyed the atmosphere practically and um, literally everything just turned loose on that day. Um, so it's, it's possible that a, a large, that God facilitated the, um, uh, the flood with a large meteorite. We know that when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, did he use a natural process to do it. Yeah, fire and brimstone, sulfur. Flaming sulfur literally was raining down on top of those four cities that God destroyed on that day. Okay, And it's possible that that sulfur may have come from some source where it exploded and literally rained down on top of those people. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have, it's still a miracle of God or a work of God that he did it that way. But I believe that he used natural processes that way. Just like the water here was real in the days of the flood. The water's coming up from the earth and coming down from the sky. Anyway, verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. As the smoke of a great furnace. So the pit is the bottomless pit. It's leads into hell, and uh, that's a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. These are devils. These are not just crickets or grasshoppers. These are devils. These are spirits, evil, very evil beast spirits. The locusts came out of the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth nor any green thing, nor any tree. That's what locusts do. They eat grass and they eat leaves and everything like that. But here, they're not doing that. Was, there's something different about them. Um, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Now, guess what? Hold your, hold your place there, Gary. And let's go back to Genesis 7. Genesis 7. Look at verse 24. I'm going to give you a minute while I take a sip of water to read verse 24, Genesis 7. How long is 150 days? Five months. Same amount of time, isn't it? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. I think he meant it. I think he meant it exactly. I think every, there's lots of things that fit into this. And I mentioned that last Sunday night. More than just marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking. I think the days are in this too. Because yet exact same time period. That, okay, it rained for 40 days, but the water's still going up. Okay? He keeps doing that past the 40 days, day 150, it stopped going up. On day 151, it starts going back down. Day 160, day 200, water is going back down. Okay? Tops of the mountains are starting to be seen again. Slowly but surely, the water's 
go back down. It takes about a year. Okay? So anyway, to me, that connects because here's the fountains of the great deep, water coming up from the heart of the earth, but also now in the future, we're going to have devils coming up out of the heart of the earth for the exact same time period. Okay? And notice verse 5 of Revelation 9. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Never been hit by a scorpion. I don't want to be. Uh, and in those days, notice this, shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die. Death shall flee from them. So you think about this. Nobody on the earth dies for five months. Nobody does. Now, there are people dying right now. Right now, somebody just died somewhere in the world. There may be hundreds of people that died. By the end of this day, thousands of people all over the earth will have died. It's a big world. There's a lot of people, 7 billion people in it. And people die. People die every day. Okay? But you're going to have an unusual event take place. Something's going to happen when these locusts with their scorpion tails strike all the people of the earth. Something about their strike. They don't die. Now, uh, Lindsay had the COVID virus. And she said, Dad, it was my body ached so bad, I wanted to die. Okay? I, yeah, I've been that sick before. You just hurt, you ache, you don't want to live. Okay? You don't want to, you don't want to experience that. It's very painful. All right? So, the people of the earth during this time are, in, are being tormented so bad that they want to die. But they can't. Nobody dies for five whole months. So now think about it. I preached this morning about God said, I'm going to give you the fruit of your thoughts. So what, what are they working on now as far as genetics, medication, technology? The cure for death itself. Ray Kurzweil, you haven't heard much about from him lately, he's getting old. His goal was in his lifetime to find a cure for death. That man does not want to die. His father's death affected him deeply. He was very close to his father. And so he doesn't want to die and he, wants, he works for Google now, leading a team of a think tank to look for a cure so that man can cheat death and man won't die. Well, it looks to me like God's going to give that. Remember what was said to Eve, ye shall not surely die. So she's thinking, oh, I can disobey God, but I won't suffer any consequences for it. So that's what I'll do. And that's what she did. Okay? So, during this time, these devils come up from the earth. And let's, let's look at the example of, of what they look like. Uh, verse 7. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. Notice they are androgynous. They look like... People you've seen at Walmart, I'm sure. A guy with a woman's hair and a woman's dress. Ugh! There used to be at this Walmart over here a hairdresser in their salon. That was a, we, the old term was transvestite or cross-dresser. Now it's transgendered. But he would wear, I guess he grew his hair long, put up makeup, and wear female clothing every day and fix hair over there. Pretend that he was a woman. But his DNA said, oh no you're not. You're a man. Okay? But these spirits are androgynous spirits. They're opposites. 
Think iron and clay, sons of God, daughters of men, male, female, yin and yang. Because that's what that represents. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. This also is a description of Joel's army in Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3. Their faces were as the, uh, excuse, I already read that. And verse 9, they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. There's your iron kingdom connection. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. That's in Joel chapter 2. And they had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. He mentions it again. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue had this name Apollyon. Both of those mean destroyer. So um, it was tweeted out the other day, the World Health Organization meeting, and they're talking about, they're meeting with Chinese representatives to talk about coronavirus, and they got a statue of Shiva, who is called the destroyer, on the, de on the desk where they're meeting. Their God is overseeing their meeting. There's a statue of Shiva at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider in Belgium. Okay, that's the God that they were, it's the Antichrist. And Shiva does this dance and he's surrounded by flames. What does that tell you? Where he is? He's in the furnace. Okay, that king that comes out is, I believe, the beast, the Antichrist. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the king of the bottomless pit, Abaddon and Apollyon. So he comes up from the depths of the earth. Then, let's go to Revelation 12. The windows of heaven were open. Verse 3. Um... In fact, let's read verse 1. Let's get the context of it because I think, I think it matters in relation to something that Peter said on the day of Pentecost. There appeared, verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. So, Hold your place there and turn to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, um, in Acts chapter 2, verse, all oh, the start in verse um, 17, it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, he's quoting from Joel. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above. Now, a lot of people, they interpret that. There's been comets that's passed by. People said, say hey, that's, that's the wonders in heaven. That's Jesus is coming. Or UFOs. Those, that's the wonders in heaven. Jesus is coming. I think the Bible tells us what these wonders in heaven are in Revelation 12. The great wonder in heaven, the woman clothed with the sun, and then another wonder in heaven, the great red dragon. I think those are the wonders in heaven that appear on the, that Peter and Joel were referring to. I think that is a better fit. In other words... Bible is interpreting Bible instead of every time, I mean, the, the 2017 solar eclipse. Remember that? That was awesome. But Jesus didn't come. But people said that he was. He's late by about three years. So, obviously it wasn't that. So I think these wonders in heaven that you see in Revelation 12 are what is being referred to. So, uh, back in Revelation 12, another wonder in heaven, verse 3, Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child. That's Christ, 
and his church, I believe. Because Jesus said to one of the seven churches, to him that overcometh, you shall, you shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. Then it says Jesus shall rule all nations with a rod of iron. But anyway, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron? And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that he should feed her there a thousand two hundred three score days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, the day of the flood, we have two things. The water comes up from the heart of the earth. The water comes down from the heavens. In the last days, we have an event where we have devils coming up out of the earth. And we have devils literally falling out of the sky like rain or more like fire and brimstone. But I think that's the, the connection, the interpretation of the source of the water. The fact that the 40 days, I believe, represents the fourth kingdom. It's a kingdom ruled over by principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So they're coming up from both ways, opposites. Now they're going to flood the earth, but not with water. So I'm going to read you a couple verses and we'll quit and I'll pick this up next Sunday night. Psalm 18, 4. The sorrows of death can pass me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So now, now the Bible's telling us that there's a different kind of flood. It's not a flood of water. It's a flood of ungodly men. Psalm 32, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. Uh, Psalm 69, 2, I sink in deep mire. I mean, all through the book of Psalms, he's talking about waters and floods. And I mean, it's there where there's no standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. Psalm 90, verse 5, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. But the key verse here is Psalm 18, 4, The floods of ungodly men. And there's more to it. We'll get into it next Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. But I think the re- enactment of Noah's flood is going to happen, but it's going to be instead of water, it's going to be devils. Fiery spirits. Fiery spirits. There is a parable that Jesus taught us about a wise man building his house. One, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man does what? And what causes the destruction of the foolish man's house? The rains came down and the floods came up. Remember that song? I love that song. Okay. Well, that's, I think that's part of it. I do. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Glad he's awake. Let's stand to our feet. Always interpret. Bible prophecy with Bible prophecy. Always interpret Scripture with Scripture. The words mean something. The words are important. The words, there's a language structure in the King James Bible. You just don't see in any other translation. It just, it just ties it together better than any, any other Bible does. It's amazing. This book is amazing. Father, thank you for opening our eyes to this book. 
And Father, we right now, we can't see it for what it really is going to be. We, can, we believe what we read in the Scriptures. We believe every word of it. And while some may say that there are symbols and metaphors and so on in the Bible, I understand that. But Father, I think you speak the way you do because you're right. And you don't speak in mysteries and you don't speak in allegories that aren't true. You say things that are right and true. And faithful are your words. So, Father, help us to see them that way. That if you said the beast has seven heads, the beast has seven heads. So, Father, give us then the instruction on that, the meaning of it. Help us with our understanding. Because we can't understand this book without you telling us what you really meant. I thank you, God, for all the time that we spend studying your word. It's not time wasted. It isn't. Especially in a day when there's so much ignorance about the word of God and what it really says. So, Father, help us to shine as bright lights, as Bible believers, Lord or even the smartest of all the smart people, God, would just stand in awe at the wisdom that you give to the simple man because he believes your word. And he believes every word of it. So sanctify your word, magnify your word above even your name. We love you and we trust in your word. Let it be our lamp and our guide throughout this week. We love you. Bring us back to the next appointed time. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.